left here. Okay, um, so I'll do a brief overview of the Science Gateways Community Institute. Um, we are funded by the National Science Foundation, as Wida mentioned, to provide um, support to the Science Gateway community. And we're funded to do this at no or very little cost. So in most cases, it's completely free for projects to request our services and get our help. Um, so we help developers, users, various people in a number of ways. Um, I'm going to start my summary uh, by looking at the bottom part of this circle where it's called support for building and running uh, gateways. Um, we, we have three main areas and under this area we help actually build gateways. So we have developers on staff who are available to offer hands-on development support. Um, this is huge. It can be a big commitment to do such a project. Um, we can also help people improve gateways that already exist. If you already have a platform, it just needs improvement. We have software developers who can help with that as well. Um, we can give advice from other consultants, which includes people like myself and Paul. Um, I can help with communications efforts, social media, um, that dreaded word marketing um, efforts when you're trying to reach people and um, engage your community, which is just an important part of everything that you do when you're trying to get users to understand your project. Um, Paul's team does usability. We have cybersecurity consultants. We have consultants who cover business planning. It has a whole range of uh, services that we offer through that uh, consultancy service um, area. Also under this uh, area, we have a catalog of gateways and software. Um, this is a website where we have compiled a bunch of gateways that exist. And um, it's offered as a place where you can go to either reuse gateway technologies or to discover gateways um, that you can use for your own research, teaching, and learning. Um, I'll next talk about the education and training area. Um, we offer a monthly webinar series and our webinar series, um, I'll talk about a little bit more later when I talk about communications efforts, but basically just offering gateway users, developers, enthusiasts with information that they can use. Um, one of our most popular offerings is the Gateway Focus Week. And essentially this is a five day intensive workshop, which traditionally took place in person. Um, I always refer to the skills that you gain as business chops for people who have nothing to do with business. Um, operating and sustaining a gateway can take on a little bit of a business uh, bent. And so we help people figure out how to become sustainable projects. And that includes looking at your audience, key stakeholders, figuring out how you're going to do budgeting, um, sustainability, writing value propositions, which I'll cover a little bit today. Um, and so on. So it's a, it's a really sort of intense experience for people to sit down for five days with their teams and make a plan for how they're going to make their project sustainable. Now we had to cancel our June session um, and we didn't want the opportunity to go completely away for people to do something productive. So we decided to pivot our plans and instead we're offering June 16 to 18 uh, Jumpstart Your Sustainability Plan a virtual mini course is what we're calling it. Um, this is gonna give people an opportunity to get sort of like a head start, get going, practical, effective steps to develop sustainability strategies. And the good news is that it's not all day. Um, we are offering a one and a half hour chunks between noon and 1.30 um, for three of the days, for what's well, the whole thing is three days that are like the main sustainability sessions. And then there's gonna be opportunities for signing up for office hours to work with our instructors. Um, and then each afternoon from four to five, we're gonna cover a special topic. So that's gonna be um, cybersecurity, user experience, which Paul will do also. And then they're gonna do um, one session on budgeting. So I'll give more information on how to get signed up for that if you're interested at the end of my presentation, which I'll do after Paul. Um, we also offer student focused programs, which uh, offers students the ability to get involved in workshops. Like in the summer, we offer a coding workshop for students, um, which this year will be virtual, but it's normally in person. Internship opportunities, which we've always had summer internships, but now we're starting to offer academic year internships as well. We just launched that a couple weeks ago. 
um, and a young professionals program for people to connect with the community of people who are also working toward being gateway developers, users, builders, whatever they happen to be somehow involved with gateways. And then our website, we have lots of resources and materials for folks to take advantage of. Finally, we have our networking and community area. Um, we host an annual conference, which is supposed to be in the fall. And again, this year, we have no idea how that's going to go. Um, we're still planning like it's going to happen in person, but it's not likely that it's going to happen in person. Um, but it, whether it's a virtual event or not, it's going to happen in some way, shape, or form. It's a great opportunity for people to come together and share ideas and network. Uh, we have a community forum, which is essentially a Google group online where people can ask questions of each other and um, exchange ideas. We have two ambassadors programs. Um, the Gateway Ambassadors program is for campus-based folks to um, spread information among themselves about um, resources for building gateways. And the Science Ambassadors program, we repivoted this year as well. Um, to provide funding for people who want to promote gateways for research and education. And the funding we're providing this year can be used for publishing in open access journals or conference proceedings, for presenting a virtual conference, um, or providing training to others. Um, and all of the virtual options are completely acceptable. We also have an affiliates program, which uh, gives software, software and resource providers the opportunity to expand their reach by providing assistance to gateway projects. So we have a bunch of people who have signed on to help out. And likewise, the partner program, um, we partner with different groups to um, benefit the SGCI community by offering support from those people that sign on. And we also offer on our website a news blog and job postings section um, where folks can um, stay in touch with what's going on in the gateway community. So that is the very quick rundown of what SGCI does. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, usability, specifically with respect to onboarding. Um, and what I mean by that here is um, really just new users or novice users to your, to your gateway. Um, and I'm going to try to um, give a really high level overview of a few um, a, a few things um, in the in the short amount of time that I have. Um, it's largely um, sort of an abridged version of a few other webinars that I've given, and I think we'd have uh, linked one of them in the notes. Um, and so you can, if you're interested, you can go go there to get a, a bit of a deeper dive into some of these things. Um, to g give you a little bit of context about where um, I'm drawing from um, for some of these things. So uh, with uh, SGCI, I've done about somewhere in the range of 35 uh, consulting engagements um, over the past few years. So what that means is doing uh, usability consulting with 35 different gateways. Uh, and they have been in many different uh, disciplines, different contexts, um, from chemistry education, hurricane modeling, libraries, um, and and a number of other other spaces. And so, it's a pretty broad range of 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 contexts and a, a good number of projects that I've gotten a, a feel for some of the common issues and things that uh, occur frequently. Um, from a usability perspective in, in a gateways kind of setting. And so what I want to do um, today is talk to you about um, some usability issues that are uh, frequently, that I frequently see um, in, in gateways projects. And I, these are, I think, specifically relevant for new users or for, for onboarding, you know, new users. Um, and I also think they're things that you can address and fix on your own. And so I really wanted to try to focus in on those um, and provide some concrete suggestions for how you can uh, make the experience better for, for new users when they encounter your gateway. So I'm going to talk about two specific issues. Um, and then I'm going to talk about two ways to actually evaluate your, your gateway. Um, 
uh, one with with uh, users and one without, and uh, that'll give you some some practical um, tools, hopefully, to to do some of your own evaluation work. Okay, so. The first issue that I want to talk about is that when a new user comes to your, your site, um, often they're confused about what to look at, especially what to look at first. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of what I mean by that. And the second issue is that users are overwhelmed by text. So there's often too much text and the, and the style of writing is not appropriate for what users expect. And so I'm going to give some examples of of that as well. So those are the two issues I'm going to dive into uh, right now. Um, so the first one, users are confused to look at, or confused about what to look at. I don't know if anybody remembers this product. Um, it, it was out, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. This is a product called Google Wave. Um, the details of that are not important, but what is important is this screenshot here, which if you've never seen it before, um, so you're a new user. Um, I'm guessing you're looking at this and you're not really sure what's going on. You're not sure what you're supposed to be looking at. What's the most important thing? Are you supposed to look at the snapshots first? Are you supposed to look at the navigation panel first? Um, most people don't know what's going on here. Uh, there's there's a lot of stuff and, and people don't know where to look. And when people don't know where to look, um, they don't feel comfortable and they don't feel confident about what to do next. And and probably they're just going to leave. They're not going to use it um, if they have if they have the option not to. Um, and of course, this product doesn't exist anymore. And uh, I'm guessing this is one of the reasons why. Um, and I'm going to discuss a, a specific principle um, in just a second after I show another example. So just keep this this uh, sort of example in mind. Um, here's another website that I that I grabbed a screenshot from. Um, it's it's not a gateway, but it's sort of just a typical website that that you might see with a number of different pages um, and some headlines um, and menu items. And um, the sort of naive assumption about the way that people would first approach this if they're new here is that they would um, do something like this in terms of actually where their where their eyes are going to go, what they're going to look at. Um, so they would, you know, start at the top, they would go across and look at the options, then they would jump down a bit, look at the those sort of sub menu items. Um, then they would probably go down, look at some more of these items and then make sort of a rational choice about where they want to go next. Um, turns out that's not really how people look at uh, web pages. And so what they do is they look for things that their eyes can anchor onto. So certain things draw their attention um, and they might look here first um, at the large text. They might look here first, um, also some large text and a picture and some colors and maybe they would look there second or third. Um, and so really it's more about something on the page that's drawing attention and telling people where to look rather than a, than a sort of rational and sequential process of, 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 scanning, um, of scanning the items that you sort of want them to. Um, and so this um, brings me to a principle which is called visual hierarchy. And this is something that you really want to have in mind when you're designing your page. It's especially, it's always important, but it's especially important for first time users, for new users, people who are trying to figure out what your gateway is and what it's all about. Um, and what this refers to is that you can use um, elements on your, on your page. So arrangement and styling that implies importance. It tells people where to look. It says, this thing's the important thing. Look here first um, and look somewhere else second and somewhere else third. Um, and so really what this does is it influences the order in which people see things. Um, and it's a very subtle, it's a very subtle um, way to, de to design a page, but you can often um, replicate how people are, what, in what order people are going to see things on your page. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to show you 
uh, do a little experiment here. So I'm gonna show you something on the next page. Um, don't think about it too much. Just look at whatever you see and let your eyes go where they want to go. Um, and, and then I'll talk about it in a, in a second. Okay, so everyone's probably had a chance to read it. Um, what you'll what you'll see, uh, or I mean, I've done this a number of times, and and what tends to happen is most people read it in the order in which it suggests you'll you'll read this. So it says you'll read this first, and then the second. Um, people don't read necessarily top to bottom; um, they read based on this idea of visual hierarchy. So things that are bigger and call attention more, uh, people's eyes are going to go there first. Um, and so this this uh, this principle can be exploited in your designs and um, really help people uh, not feel confused and know where to look when they when they come to your page. I'm going to show a couple examples of some websites. Um, this is a, a website for Node.js uh, JavaScript uh, library. This is an old version, probably five years old or something. And what you see here is um, not much of a visual hierarchy. Um, Probably where people are going to look first is at the logo because it's big. Um, and otherwise, they're going to just sort of look around for something to anchor on to. Um, so this is not a really good example um, of how to do things. But the page I'm going to show next, um, this is a redesign of the same page um, from more uh, more recent time, maybe it's only maybe it's a year old or something. Um, and what you see now is a much better use of visual hierarchy. Um, most people are going to look either here or here first. Um, there's larger text. There, there's sort of buttons and and colors that are used, and that just draws people's eyes there. And so it tells people look here first. And this is of course based on what most users want. They want to download. Um, and if they, if they want other things, you can see all the menu items up at the top for documentation and so on. Most people don't come to the website wanting documentation first. So if they want that, they can find it. Um, but really you want to call out the things that people want first and foremost. Um, so there are a number of things that you can use to create this visual hierarchy. Um, color and contrast and, and scale and your, your fonts, the, you know, the sizing um, and spacing and composition. And so blending those things, you can really create that visual hierarchy and it tells people uh, where to look when they come to your site. And so they, they have a much better uh, sort of feeling of confidence and satisfaction about what they're looking at and, and what they need to do. Um, so that's, that's the first issue. It's fairly simple, somewhat easy to, to spot and, and fairly easy to, to fix and uh, really helpful for, for new users. Um, the second issue is that users are overwhelmed by text, too much text. And this is something that I see very frequently with gateways, especially with gateways. I think maybe because the creators of gateways are mostly scientists, uh, researchers, and you know developers, and they're very used to reading a lot of text, writing text, writing papers, um, uh, and that's not how people operate on the web. Um, people don't read as if they're reading a paper um, or, or or an article. And making that mistake can be really costly in terms of people, in, in terms of, of usability and in terms of the experience. Um, I'm gonna describe a um, study that was done really quickly and I'll put a link here that you can go and find some more uh, details about that. Um, but what was done is um, there was a, a, a chunk of text that was taken um, from a website. Um, you can see it here. It's some um, text about Nebraska and it was in, in a tourism kind of, of, of context. Um, and what they did is they took the text and they manipulated it in a, in a few different ways. And then they, they um, put it on a, on a site and then studied what the usability outcomes were. And so here you see the original text. Um, so this, is, this sort of forms the, the control for the experiment. Um, 
in the next version, they just cut the word count by 50%. So they took out uh, half the words. In the uh, next version, they um, took the original text, but made it more scannable. So they used bullet points. Um, and so people don't, didn't necessarily have to read sequentially top to bottom. Then in the next version, they used more objective language. Um, so they, you can see in compared to the control, they took out some of the um, um, more subjective kinds of, of language. Um, and then in the final version, they combined um, all of the other ones. Um, so it's scannable, there's less text, and it's more objective. So they combined those three things. Um, and then they, they ran an experiment um, where people were exposed to these, and then they did a, a usability test on them. Um, what they found was that in all conditions, the uh, usability improvement was um, fairly substantial, as you can see. Um, the way that they quantified the improvement there. Um, and in the combined version, it was, it was by far um, the best improvement. Um, and so really the suggestion here is that you want to make text concise. Um, it needs to be scannable um, and it needs to be objective um, in terms of, of the language. And that's going to make people um, much more likely to read the text. Um, and They'll, they'll actually, ironically, they'll spend more time reading less text. And I'm going to show you a, another study that was done that, that exemplifies that. Um, so here's another case study that was done. Um, there's a link that you can go uh, there and read about it. Um, this was done with a startup company at the time called Scalar, um, which I think they did something with, um, with web logs or something. Um, it was sort of a cloud-based cloud, a cloud -based, um, startup company. And what this guy did, he's the one who writes about this case study. He went and uh, did a usability assessment with them. Uh, and one of the things they did was they took their features page, which had a lot of text, a lar you know, large amount of text, and they uh, cut it down substantially. So they took out uh, a lot of the text that was there. Um, and then they did a, a follow-up study to see um, what the results were. Um, and so what they found was that after removing a significant amount of the text, people actually spent on average 30% more time on that page. Um, and so the, you might expect with less text that people would spend less time, but it's actually the opposite. So, um, less text that's scannable and concise, people will actually read it. Text that's written as if it's an article, uh, people won't read it. They'll just leave or they'll ignore it. Um, they'll only read it if that's what they're expecting to, to see. Um, and so the redesigned page looks something like this. Um, it's, it's not bad, uh, probably could be even a bit less, less text. But what you're seeing is some clear headings um, that sort of are also employing this idea of visual hierarchy, pulling people's eyes there, um, and it's it's fairly concise, and um, people will, as a result, actually read it. Um, so, two really simple guidelines. Um, it might this might seem really really simple and straightforward, but the um, results of of paying attention to this are very um, real, and I think these are things that anyone can can notice, you know, if they know what to look for and they can remedy on their own. Um, and so really, you know, use visual hierarchy and write text that's, that's scannable and concise. If that's all you can take away from this, I think it's, it is really helpful. Um, there's a um, example that you can go and take a look at, which is, um, this is an example of a gateway that, that we've worked with, uh, which is NanoHub. Um, if you go and go to their homepage and just sort of scroll up and down and, and just keep those two things in mind and you'll see they've done a pretty good, pretty good job there. And so here you see um, a very clear, you know, large sort of um, call out uh, text there that people are going to look at. Um, these four segmented sort of um, large panels there that are, that are kind of like menu items, people are going to look at those and then 
um, decide where to go. And if you scroll down, you'll see some good use of, of scannable text too. And so people are not gonna feel too overwhelmed um, and they're gonna feel like they know what's going on here and what they're supposed to be looking at. Um, so I'm gonna go through two um, usability evaluation methods um, really quickly, just at a really high level, but it, enough that you'll get a sense of what they are and that you can go and um, look, at, look at more resources for, for doing these. Um, so the first one is, the name is a cognitive walkthrough. Um, this is something you can do on your own. You don't need to recruit any users. And then what we refer to as a more typical usability test, where you would actually sit people down and, and watch them do something. Um, so with the cognitive walkthrough, it's a task-based assessment. So you're, you're thinking about it from the perspective of people doing some kind of tasks with your system. And you're doing a walkthrough with your system while you're asking a few questions, four questions to be, to be specific. And so what you wanna do first is define your users. That's always key, know who your users are, what do they want, um, and then identify some tasks that you're going to test. Um, and break those down into subtasks or actions that people need to perform. I'm gonna show you a really simple example in a second. You're gonna ask four questions for each of these tasks. So will users be trying to produce the right outcome? Um, essentially, do users need to know that this is the thing that, they, that they're supposed to do? Um, is the thing that they need to do visible? Is the action visible? You know, is there a button or something that they can, they can look for? Will the user recognize the action as the right one to do? Um, and will the user understand whatever happens as a result? So will they understand the feedback? Um, so a really simple example is you know, something like Google Drive. Um, and this is something you can do with your own gateway. You pull it up and then you know, formalize this and ask these questions. So if you take a task like uploading something to Google Drive, um, I've just broken it down here into, into a few subtasks. So they're gonna press the upload files button. They're gonna select a file from the computer. They're gonna submit it. Um, and I can go through this and ask these questions. And so I can say, you know, will the user be trying to produce the right outcome? Do they, will they know that this is the thing that they need to do? Most likely for most users, they know that they need to click something and upload. So that's, that's good. Is the action visible? This one's a little bit tricky. So if you're familiar with Google Drive, um, you're gonna have to click on the My Drive button first, and then there's a drop down, and then you're gonna click on Upload Files. So I would say this is not really an optimal design here. There's some issues um, um, that you know, could, could be better. Will the user recognize the action as the right one? So you know, given the list of things, are they gonna know which is the right one? Probably, if they wanna upload a file, I think it's fairly clear. Will they understand the feedback? Um, depends on what happens after, but it says, you know, your upload was successful or something, then yes. Um, so this is, a, this is a very simple example, but you can imagine making this much more complex, um, identifying a set of tasks and subtasks and then going through them um, in your site. And, you know, you, you notice little things like the one I just pointed out, which is that the upload files action is not quite visible um, from the page unless the user knows to click on that drop-down box and that that could lead to usability problems um, and so and that's it that's basically it in terms of doing a cognitive walkthrough so you're breaking down these tasks and you're walking through them and, and asking some questions at each each point point. Um, and in the end you're likely going to come out with some ideas for making improvements um, so that's something that, that anyone can do, I think, with this very simple recipe. I can, I can share some links for, you know, guides on how to, how to do these. Um, and the second one is a usability test. So this is um, when you're actually going to sit down with users and get them to do something and observe them. Um, I'm not going to show a demo of that right now. Um, there are a number online. This is something that I do in the focus week um, that Nidi was mentioning. And so really what you're gonna do, um, this, this doesn't have to be very formal, grab a colleague, a student, somebody, sit them down and again, ask them to do a task. And don't, don't help them, just sit them down and say, do this thing and observe. And notice all the places where they get confused um, 
and you, you do this with a handful of people, three, four, five, and you're gonna find um, some really uh, useful um, information. Um, people are always surprised at the stuff that they find, but it's really critical that you ask someone else to do it. Don't do it with you and your partner who have developed this gateway because you're too close to it and you're not, you're not gonna act like a, like a first time user. So it's really not a good sample for for the onboarding process if you're not new to it. Uh, so that's sort of the key, key thing to keep in mind. That's why you just grab a colleague or someone who's not familiar. Um, there are lots of examples. This is a nice one. Um, if you search for uh, rocket surgery made easy on YouTube, um, there's also a book and a website. This was made for people who are not experts. So actually this is a really nice resource, walks you through usability testing. Um, in a, in a very simple and straightforward way. And it's really something that I think you, you all can do. Um, so just to, to summarize, um, the two issues I think that are, you can really focus on yourselves, um, use visual hierarchy, indicate to people where they need to look, um, don't use too much text and write scannable text. Don't write text as if it was a scientific article. Um, and then to do your own evaluations, cognitive walkthrough, um, you can do on your own, no users required, and a usability test, users required, um, ideally not yourselves, uh, but colleagues and, and other people are fine. And I think if you combine these, even though it seems very simple, um, is really gonna help you improve your onboarding process. It's gonna tell you a lot about what new users are going to, what their experience is gonna be like when they um, encounter your gateway. And that's all I have for you. That was great, Paul, thank you. Um, we did, do you wanna take questions now or should we go to Pierre first? Actually, do you have a preference on your end? What we do next? However you'd like is fine. Mary, why don't you go ahead and go first just so we make sure that we hear. Okay. Your presentation. And I would suggest if people have questions, go ahead and scribble those in the chat so that you don't forget them. And uh, I don't mind sending them to Paul later and making him do some writing work for us. Thank you sure. so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was terrific. Yes, if we run out of time, that's completely okay to um, send us questions. I'm going to be giving you my contact information. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I think. Okay, good. All right, I'm gonna zoom through this. <laughs> See, it's 2.45. All right, so um, I would like to share with you today some um, ideas of how you can go about developing a plan for community outreach. And you'll notice that I'm avoiding the term marketing. Again, I brought that up earlier as something that people don't like to hear about very much. But really what we wanna cover today is um, about three major things. Um, the first I'm going to talk about is value proposition. Um, this is work that you can do that will help you identify the primary value that your project brings to users, and that can really help you with your outreach efforts. The second is the importance of thinking through and focusing on two or three communication channels so that you're not overwhelmed. And finally, uh, the consistent modes of communication that we use and how we think about content creation as an example for you so that you have some idea of how um, all of this can play out. So it's an important step when you're planning communications to define your project for users. Um, this is important for both you and the user side, uh, just so you know exactly what it is that you're offering and this is something that you often have to work through just to get funding a lot of times anyway, but um, doing it from a communications perspective can really help too. Uh, solidify plans. So what does your project offer that can't be found anywhere else? And what is it that's valuable about what your project offers? So during the focus week, one of the major pieces of work that people do is defining a value proposition. And I'm going to give you a really quick rundown of what that looks like. Um, basically, what you're doing when you work on value proposition is developing a clear understanding of the unique value your project delivers to the community of users. And essentially that ends up being a statement and it's a statement that cl clearly communicates th that value. We have a really simple template that you can use to do this. You name your project, you say who it's going to help, 
what it's going to do and how it does it. And just taking this time to write a really clear and concise statement can help really narrow down exactly what the essence is of what your project is out offering users. So how does this help in outreach efforts? Um, it should really inform a lot of what you do, especially communication efforts. It's going to help you identify what your community needs to know about. Is it about features? Is it about enhancements that have been made? New tools you've added on? Are there updates? Um, it's going to help you identify the important things to offer for your community. So what is it that you can do to help them achieve their goals by using your uh, project, by what you offer? And how will I support my community? So are you going to offer upcoming learning or engagement opportunities? Do you have resources to offer? Do you have support um, available for people? All really important questions. Um, so one of the things that people do when they're trying to decide how to communicate with their communities, which is often a big mistake, is they try to do it all. And realistically, you have other things going on. And if you try to do everything, you're not going to be able to do anything well. So my best advice to you is to pick the things that you think are going to be the most useful or that you enjoy and pick two or three of those and stick to them. So limit and commit. Um, there isn't enough time in a day to do all the things. So if you choose to do social media, don't try to use every platform. If you choose to do it, then find the one that you think your community is most present in and where you can reach people and use that one and do it well, rather than trying to do a post on every single type of social media and never really doing it well or engaging with people because you don't have the time. So these are good questions to ask. Do you want to use an exist existing email list? Maybe EarthCube has a list that's beneficial to you. Are you going to create your own list? Again, social media is an option. Um, attending webinars, guest webinar presentations, organizing your own webinars, uh, conferences, which are, of course, mostly virtual right now. And of course, there's many other avenues that you can explore. So what I've done is I've kind of laid out like our main consistent modes of communication for you all. So I can talk through how we think about our efforts um, to engage our community. Our community is a little bit different than yours would be, but still the ideas are the same about how you would organize this information and share um, opportunities with people. I'm a very example based person. So for me, it really helps to see things laid out. So I hope that it's helpful to you too. Our main modes of communication are a monthly newsletter. And in between, we do an occasional one off to make special announcements about um, big opportunities or special things that are coming up that we want to highlight. Um, we feature a news blog and job postings area on our website where we try to post things that are useful to our community. Um, we're on Twitter and we have a LinkedIn account as well, which I have a hard time engaging with. So I focus mostly on Twitter. Um, it's a little bit easier to communicate with people in our community there and I get a lot more engagement um, through that avenue. And then the final is a monthly webinar series. Um, I'm highlighting this one in particular, but we have several opportunities for learning and engagement. Um, but the reason why I thought I would highlight the webinar series is because it could be something you could consider to do um, not necessarily monthly, maybe quarterly or, or not even regularly scheduled, but as you're thinking about onboarding your communities and trying to decide how you let people know how to use features that are on your gateway. So I just filled out a template just so I can show you kind of like what our goals are and how that feeds into our communication efforts. So we will help gateway developers, users, and enthusiasts to facilitate at little or no cost the sharing of gateway related experiences, technologies, and practices. And we'll do this by offering services and resources that make the process of developing, operating, and sustaining a gateway less challenging and less time consuming. So what that looks like in our monthly newsletter is that we feature upcoming opportunities for learning and engagement. We provide a summary of recent news blog and job postings on the website. And we also provide relevant opportunities and events from others in the community. I know this is a lot of words, but um, I wanted you to be able to refer back to this um, in case that's helpful to you. Um, but 
the big letters here, the big font indicates the main points. You'll have to be organized to do a newsletter. Um, trying to pull it all together at the last minute never goes well. So keeping track of opportunities you'd like to share throughout the month if you're doing a monthly or throughout the quarter if you're doing it quarterly is the best way so that you can have everything at your fingertips ready to go when you're pulling it all together. Keeping con content clear and concise is super important. I mean, this <clears throat> the readability that uh, Paul talks about applies to content creation everywhere, really. Um, you'll want to include only the most important pieces of information in a newsletter. If you go on and on for paragraphs, people aren't going to get to the next thing in the newsletter because they're just trying to read one thing and realistically, we all get too much email. So really the bulk of the content should be posted elsewhere and that should be easy to find. For us, that means we post on our website and then we feature a very small blurb and then a link to the more info. Um, try not to bombard people with emails. This is good advice for any day. <laughs> um, you should decide on a bi-monthly, monthly, quarterly, and just stick to it. And as I mentioned before, we do an occasional one-off, um, but we try to really keep it to a minimum and we really, really look hard at it and say, do we really need to do this before we send them? Because we don't want people to get annoyed by our constant emails. And finally, soliciting relevant information from um, others in the community. Uh, if you get contributions from others, they're also more likely to then share your information when you're in need of spreading the word. So it's good to build that kind of a connection with folks. Um, this is a, a few screenshots of our most recent newsletter. Um, I struggle still with keeping things too short. I work hard at it, but I still sometimes just can't keep it short enough because there's too many things that I need to say. So I would say that the section that's about applying to be a science ambassador is appropriate. It tells people what the program is, what's available, how much support we can give, and then boom, go over here to look for more. Student programs got wordy this time because we just announced the academic year internships and I had to give that some space. But I tried to use bolding and links whenever possible to make it scannable. Um, the Goodreads area is just highlighting some of the recent articles that I've published on our website. This includes um, success stories that we write that are in our blog or articles that are written about us um, and various other things. Um, the short survey from Trustworthy Data Working Group was a group reached out to me and asked if I could share that for them and we were happy to do that. Again, that reciprocity is really, really valuable. And then little things like follow us on Twitter, little reminders like that are always nice and helpful too. So um, let's see, what do I have here? Five minutes. Okay, um, our news section features whatever is beneficial to our community to know about. So that can mean uh, news, exciting news about a partner who was recently given a giant award. It could mean um, webinars being offered by our partners or people who are doing work that's relevant to our community. Um, it could mean highlighting gateways that are in the news and so on. Sometimes these are articles that I've written. Sometimes they're ones that I'm resharing. It's just anything that could be of interest. Our blog area, we really dedicate to um, um, writing one success stories and what we call a success story is essentially a former client of ours who we had an engagement with and we'd like to tell their story and the reason we do this is i mean it's not just to toot our own horns but to be able to um, share examples of how what we offer can help people so a lot of times people look at what we offer and there's a lot you know there's so many different things that they can take advantage of and these are really specific examples of how engagements went and what people were able to benefit from by engaging with us. And then we also have guest blogs that are written by others. Um, and we also have tech blogs written by our staff. The intention of the tech blogs is to help people understand technologies that were used in gateways that our developers worked on and then to offer the steps that it would take to implement them on your own, or you can ask our developers to help you with that as well. And a number of other topics are covered in blogs too. Jobs are pretty straightforward. We just post job opportunities whenever we see them that could be relevant to our community. Um, on Twitter, we share content from our website and upcoming opportunities. Um, I create a weekly schedule of things that I wanna talk about, and that makes it easy for me to know what's coming up, and that way I can um, work on creating images and promoting that stuff throughout the week 
it's all about what's coming up. So it depends on, on what events we have coming up or what I've published recently that I want to share. Um, just so you know, um, I'm a community engagement person. That's my job. So I have the luxury of time to spend on this, but I recognize that many people are doing this on top of everything else that they're doing. So um, creating a schedule and, and writing those messages out in one sitting can be really valuable. And there are automation services that work really well, like you could use Hootsuite or Buffer and other various um, automated services where you just pop in your messages, schedule them, and they'll get tweeted out for you when you tell it to, or you can ask it to optimize for you. Um, I try to check in a few times a day, but not too many times because then I get sucked into reading too many things that I shouldn't be reading. But I check in a few times a day so that I can retweet others who are posting relevant content for our community. And again, this motivates them to do the same for you in return. And then just a quick tip about tagging. If you're not aware of this yet, just in case you don't know, when you tag somebody else's account, so for example, I know my images are kind of tiny here, but you can see this top layer here where I have the community announcements about Jumpstart. Um, I tagged Exceed who had shared this announcement and by doing so I appeared in their feed and also they saw it and they retweeted me. So I ended up in their feed two times that way. So that helps stretch my reach. And then we have monthly webinars where we feature rotating selections of topics. And this is just really helpful to our community. So some key takeaways are to think through your value proposition to help you decide on what it is that's important to communicate. Um, choose platforms carefully, limit and commit. Uh, create useful content and share it as succinctly as possible. And then make sure that that content is findable on your website or someplace consistent. Some people tend to put information in emails or in communications on a, as a standalone and then that email gets lost or deleted or something and two weeks later that person is trying to figure out where they saw that thing, how can they find it again, and it'd be really great if they can just go to your website or wherever you're offering your information to um, search for it instead of having to scramble to find this elusive email that they saw this information in. So here's my information. You're welcome to email me directly. Um, we also have a help desk, which I operate, so you'd still be reaching me, but I would share your request with somebody relevant if it's not a question for me. Um, we invite you to request uh, services. Um, we don't mention that our services are available at no cost, so if you want to request services, you're welcome to do that. And in fact, we're not limited to just NSF projects. Um, we're allowed to help out other funded projects as well, so please don't be shy. Um, and our newsletter sign up is available at this link and we're at Science Gateways on Twitter. And then one last quick plug for Jumpstart Your Sustainability Plan. If you want to get started on a sustainability plan, this is a great opportunity to do it without a huge commitment. Our focus week, which this is replacing for now, is a five-day in-person commitment. And this is a small snapshot of what's offered there, so you're not getting the same um, intensity as you would but you're getting a lot of really good strategies for getting started on, on sustainability. So um, all are invited to attend. Registration closes on Friday, June 12th. And I hope that some of you will consider attending. And I'm one minute over, but I did it. <laughs> you did it great. Thank you, Nair. Can I ask you one question? Since yes. this is, coincides exactly with Earth Cube um, yes. meeting, is there going to be a July equivalent of this meeting? And if so, for any given team, is there an ideal number or a, a good number of people that should go? In other words, my guess is it shouldn't be just one team member because they won't. The rest of the people won't understand what they're talking about. Do yeah, that's a that's a really good question. You're right that it's good to attend with your team members um, as many as possible. I would say, but ideally, for the folks week, for example, we encourage the PI to come and then you know two or three other team members but that varies depending on how large the teams are. Sometimes it's just one person. Um, but yeah, having your team present so that you can work through the ideas is definitely recommended. Um, we are not currently planning on repeating this um, in July, but the good news is that WIDA let me know that the hours do not conflict with your meeting. So um, the main sessions for the Jumpstart uh, are 12 to 1.30. And then um, we have special opportunities in the afternoon, like there's time for office hours and then special presentations from four to five. 
but the bulk of the sustainability portion will be 12 to 130. So maybe people can also squeeze them in. I know it's hard to do so many things at one time. Um, I don't know if we're recording this, uh, these sessions or not, but if we do, I can certainly send you links to them.